Welcome to Massey College. Bienvenue au Collège Massey. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers. I am the principal of Massey College. It's my great privilege to welcome you here at Massey College, which is located on Indigenous land, the land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We want to acknowledge our duty to honor the land and also the great privilege that we have here to talk about cities. And I'm so uh, delighted to have you all here. Uh, this is a, a, a really an important conversation to have in, uh, in Canada at this point, but internationally. And I think that's the point of this conference. Let me say a few words about the, this conference. Um, the conference aimed to look a little bit at the constitutional ambiguity. Some people have talked about constitutional silence about cities. And even though we know that the world's population live mostly in cities and that uh, they are the drivers of progress, of economic development, but also the spaces of inequities, racism, and of serious issues. We know that we cannot combat climate change without ensuring that our cities work well. Et la question aujourd'hui, c'est a-t-on la bonne gouvernance pour nos villes? C'est la question du jour. The important questions about the role of the CD now and for the future is what this is all about. So I am very grateful for the international uh, scholars that have decided to join us at Masi. It would have been so much more fun to be uh, doing it in uh, presence, in your presence, having you visiting Masi. I hope that we'll have occasion to do that in the future. But I want to thank uh, really the team of organizers, uh, the Canadian Urban Institute, the technological team, SHRC and the, Ma and the Maitri Foundation for their support for their, their conference. So um, I'm, to help us begin, uh, I'm very pleased to invite uh, the president at University of Toronto, Mary Gertler, an accomplished uh, and well-known urbanist himself uh, to welcome you. Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Massey City Summit. Cities have long been recognized as sites of economic, social, and cultural innovation. If anything, their significance in this regard has only grown over time. Economic innovation has become more geographically concentrated in major urban centers over the past 25 years. Cities have also been recognized as playing a crucial role in meeting the existential challenge of the climate crisis that now confronts humanity. And the growing social and economic divides within our population have found their most profound expression within our cities. The pandemic of the past year has highlighted and exacerbated these divides as lower income and racialized communities and neighborhoods have borne the disproportionate brunt of the COVID-19 scourge. Problems of affordable housing, food insecurity, lack of access to affordable daycare, and challenges to inclusion for Black, Indigenous, and other urban residents of color have also become more pronounced. The success of our hopefully imminent post-pandemic recovery will depend in large measure on the ability of our cities to marshal the resources and the authority needed to lead the way. This is where necessity and reality come face to face. In the 21st century, Canada has become one of the world's most highly urbanized countries. And yet our governance structures reflect a 19th century reality in which rural areas were far more significant than they are today. That's why the theme of this summit, constitutional space for cities, is so important and so timely. Of course, I have more than passing interest in these important issues. As a professor of geography and planning, I've long been interested in the role of city regions, the sites of innovation in the national and global economy. And as president of the University of Toronto, I lead a major global institution whose strength depends to a very large degree on the health and success of the urban region that is home to our three campuses. More and more, our future success depends on the strength of our cities. And that means our cities must have the jurisdiction and resources they need in order to leverage their full potential. The need for this has never been greater. Thank you all for your contributions to that end. I wish you an informative, inspiring, and successful summit. Thank you. Merci, and thank you, uh, President Gertler. 
So let me now uh, pass the mic to uh, Matti Simiatiki, the interim director of the School of City at University of Toronto. Uh, he is associate professor in the Department of Geography and Planning, and he holds the Canada Research Chair in Infrastructure Planning and Finance. Well placed to welcome us as well. Yeah, thank you, uh, Natalie. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, at the uh, kickoff of this summit. Uh, what an important time to be talking about cities, uh, their role and their responsibilities uh, within Canada and around the world. Uh, as President Gertler uh, articulated, we're in the midst of three intersecting crises. Um, the uh, pandemic is clearly a public health crisis that's seizing everyone's attention at the moment. Uh, we also have a crisis of climate change uh, bearing down uh, on our cities and the globe, uh, as well as issues of uh, systemic racism uh, and uh, inequality, which uh, uh, are uh, impossible to turn away from uh, and have been both revealed and exacerbated by the pandemic. And I think it's it's in this moment that we can think about cities. And the, the idea of, you know, at the outset of the pandemic, you heard people talking about how can we get back to normal? And, 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 and we're all in this together. Those were kind of two uh, platitudes that have now been exposed for, uh, for, their, for their shortcomings. And I think um, what has become revealed and where we're at now is the idea that not only are we not in this, all in this together, uh, but beyond that, the old normal is not possible anymore. We need to be thinking differently about how our world works and in particular how our cities work. And it's it's in this moment that exchange of ideas and uh, and, and and exchange of action is 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 critical. And I think it's summits like this that that create the the launch pad for those actions to take place. And it's in it's 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 in the ideas and the way that they get mobilized that we'll start to see the types of positive change that uh, people are uh, looking for. Just to give one very brief example from the outset of the pandemic was the way that things like active transportation and bicycle lanes um, uh, and, and more space for pedestrians uh, became part of the everyday uh, spaces of cities in ways that uh, plans that had been on the books in our city, Toronto, moved faster. They Plans had been on the books for decades, uh, like bike lanes along the Danforth Avenue, uh, where I live, uh, had been on the books for decades. And it was within the pandemic that within the span of a few months, they were ultimately implemented. This is a very tactical, small scale example that we learned from other places, used experience from elsewhere to help mobilize action here. We can now scale that up and the bigger challenges uh, are around issues of governance, issues of climate change and issues of inclusion uh, and anti-racism. And so it's in, it's in these dialogues that I think uh, we'll start to see uh, different perspectives, start to learn from others and, and provide a playbook that can help us uh, achieve cities that are better uh, than the ones that, uh, that, that we had in the past. So I very much look forward to the discussion and uh, uh, thanks again for including me. Thank you. Thank you, Matty. So uh, let's begin our panel, which is uh, entitled Principles of Federalism, but in a way it's, it's a little bit broader than this. It really is about the place of city, the type of cities that we have. And it's going to be a bit of a critical look at whether indeed constitutional change is needed and what type of constitutional change. We have uh, uh, certainly an historical perspective, we have an international perspective, and I am very, very grateful to uh, introduce our presenters. So uh, the presenters uh, will be uh, speaking for about 12, uh, 14 minutes in order, and then I will invite uh, Professor Daly to make comments uh, for eight to 10 minutes. In the context of this, feel free to use the chat to uh, uh, first acknowledge where you're from and uh, the indigenous land that you're on and also your questions if you uh, if you want to put a questions to to the panelists it will be my pleasure uh, in the last 15 to put some of the these questions to them directly but uh, feel free to continue to interact as we all do on zoom on the chat function uh, to express yourself so well, let me introduce the, our panelists. I'm going to introduce them all at once so that you see the breadth and, and the, the, of expertise and of geographical uh, sp spread that, that they represent. First, we'll hear from Professor uh, 
Zach Taylor. Uh, Dr. Taylor is a professor at the Department of Political Science at Western. He teaches uh, uh, comparative urban political economy, regional planning, governance, and he's the director of Western Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance. He's a fellow at the University of Toronto uh, Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance. He's written several very good research monographs there. He is also a non-practicing uh, professional planner in Ontario, and his book, Shaping the Metropolis Institutions and Urbanization in the United States and, the, and Canada, was published in 2019, charts a little bit the political development of urban governance in the two countries uh, since the 19th century. Then we'll hear from Professor Amal Sethi. Uh, he is a fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. He researches on comparative constitutional law and theory from an interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, he obtained his SGD from uh, University of Pennsylvania in 2020, and he really devised normative theories of role, adjudication, and design for constitutional courts in developing democracy. During his time at Penn, he was appointed legal writing fellow. He was also a fellow with the Salzburg Cutler Fellows Program and the Global Women Leadership Project. So he's been involved internationally in so many countries uh, with government, intergovernmental agencies uh, throughout the world. And we are so uh, grateful for his presence here today. I also have uh, there, we will thereafter have um, just uh, move to Professor Conrad Lackmeyer, who's the Vice Dean of Research and Professor of Public Law, uh, European Law and Foundation of Law at Sigmund Freud's uh, University of Vienna Faculty of Law. He studied law at University of Vienna and visited uh, Cambridge, uh, the Max Planck Institute of Comparative Public Law and International Law, and the Central Euro European University in Hungary. He was a, a research chair at the Institute of Legal Studies and the Center for Social Science at the Hungarian Academy of Science, and was also a research and visiting fellow at Durham Law School. He focuses on international con constitutional law and methodology of constitutional comparison. Can't wait to hear him. And finally, uh, uh, Professor uh, Margie de Visser is a professor at the Young Pong Hao School of Law in Singapore, uh, and she is works on comparative constitutional law with an institutional and procedural slant, and she's written uh, many uh, uh, research uh, papers, and she's really involved in cross-border judicial dialogues. Her recent publications include The Future is Urban, the Progressive Renaissance of the City in EU Law. Uh, she is a recipient of three uh, fellowship for research excellence. And finally, we'll hear from uh, uh, Dr. Paul Daly. He's won global recognition for his scholarship in the broad field of public law. He really is well known for his uh, scholarly work in admin and uh, administrative law. Really uh, was, uh, uh, has been completed his studies at University College Cork. He uh, also attended Penn Law School. He also uh, completed his doctorate at University of Cambridge and um, was a modern law review scholar there. Uh, he worked at Université de Montréal and also at University of Cambridge as a senior lecturer. And now he holds the University Research Chair in Administrative Law and Governance at University of Ottawa. Bienvenue, Paul. Merci d'être ici. So uh, let's hear from uh, uh, Professor Taylor first. Thank you, uh, Madame de Rosier. Let's uh, get my screen sharing here. Make sure everything is behaving as it should. All right. So uh, the premise of this event is to discuss the possibility of constitutionalizing special status for Canadian cities. And I think that before we can have this discussion, we need to take a step back. Uh, I think we need to put contemporary debates about local autonomy for cities in Canada and elsewhere into a broader political, economic, and social context. And when we do, I think we end up in a different place than proposals for the maximization of big city autonomy lead. Um, I wonder if we're having the right conversation. I think we're only looking at part of the problem and in doing so, we risk making matters worse, not better. 
To pursue this line of argument, I pose three orienting questions. First, what does it mean for a big city or any locality to be autonomous? Second, what forces drive demands for big city autonomy? Why here, why now? Third, is increasing local autonomy, whatever it means, a zero sum proposition? For cities to succeed, must other levels of government be diminished? My answers to these questions point towards an alternative perspective, which I call the meta governance of, of place. I argue that we do not have to choose between a path of disintegration in which big cities disengage from the nation states in which they are embedded and the integration of governing capacities to uh, address local problems. Rather, I argue that local autonomy is inevitably exercised within a web of interdependent authority relations and that localities are subject to powerful forces beyond their control. Maximizing local initiative and democratic accountability while also recognizing other imperatives such as equity between regions and avoiding destructive competition between localities may require more integrated governance, not less. So uh, let's turn to a fund. Let's turn to a, a, a fundamental question, right? What, is, what does local autonomy mean? Well, to begin, I'd like to make a distinction between two perspectives. Legalists define the scope of local autonomy in terms of formal constitutional and legal provisions. Many of the people you're going to hear from this week come at this question, I think, from a legalist perspective. Realists, by contrast, are concerned with the practical exercise of legal authority. While a legalist analysis may reveal the potential but not necessarily fully exploited scope of local autonomy, uh, it's not in the first instance sensitive to the context in which it is exercised. So what, what matters in this view is what is authorized. From a realist perspective, local autonomy is a latent property that only exists when it is exercised, which is in turn conditional on the locality's internal capacities and its competitive position in the market economy. There are three conceptually distinct dimensions of local autonomy. Local empowerment uh, is, legal empowerment is but one. As I discussed in a recent paper for the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance, we've seen considerable expansion of the legal authority of local governments in most Canadian provinces, including a shift from express to more permissive powers in recent decades. A second dimension is fiscal capacity or the sufficiency of resources to meet expenditure demands. This entails either greater discretionary access to new revenue bases or more generous unconditional grants. And in fact, we've seen a general trend towards both in some Canadian provinces over the past 30 years. The third dimension is immunity or barriers to intervention from other levels of government. The most stringent version of this is constitutional home rule as found in some American states. In Canada, we see commitments on the parts of provinces to consult or seek agreement before acting in the municipal sphere and so on. And these dimensions, I think, are often conflated in local autonomy discourse in Canada, but we have to recognize that each can exist without the other. And to illustrate this, I schematically compare uh, in the paper uh, U.S. home rule cities to U.K. and Canadian cities. And we see varying levels of legal empowerment, fiscal capacity, and immunity. The experience of these countries, and especially the United States, reveals a basic equation that legal empowerment plus immunity in the absence of fiscal capacity is a recipe for inequality. In essence, greater powers in a protected legal, legal sphere do not on their own pay the bills. Already rich places that have the resources to meaningfully exercise their legal authority um, on the one hand, but on the other hand, poor places find that legal powers cannot reverse a, a weak structural position in the national or global economy. And so the result is that legal and fiscal devolution can reproduce an uneven geography of advantage and disadvantage. Uh, immunity also generates a particular political dynamic. Once localities are viewed as responsible for their own fates, higher level governments have little incentive to come to the aid of those in trouble. So what drives the recent intensification of big city autonomy demands. In the 1980s and 90s, large metro areas captured employment growth in rough proportion to their share of the national population in Canada. In the 2006 to 2016 period, however, large metros have captured virtually all net jobs growth in Canada. Only 13% of net jobs were created outside the big six, where half the population lives. We see similar economic polarization in the US, the UK, and other countries where large metros have run away with growth. With economic polarization comes political polarization on urban rural lines. I argue that growing calls for big city autonomy are a, sim are a symptom of economic polarization. Uh, 
Successful regions, Canada's large metros, understandably want to protect and capitalize on their gains. But this has a dark corollary. What about everywhere else? This points to fundamental questions. Should we view local autonomy in zero sum terms? Does expanding the autonomy of localities necessarily require diminishing national or provincial power? Stepping away from the municipal level, let's consider Canada's expanding experience with multi-level collaborative policymaking to address localized policy issues. Since the early 2000s, we've seen the construction of increasingly elaborate inter interactions across levels of government in multiple policy fields, including immigrant settlement, housing and homelessness, economic development and infrastructure. In contrast to 1960s top-down command and control policymaking, these programs mobilize the resources of the federal and provincial governments to address priorities identified by local governments and stakeholders. At the same time, we see provincial actions in Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick to promote intermunicipal coordination at the regional scale in economic development, land use planning, infrastructure, and service delivery. And ultimately, these activities are motivated by the recognition of complex interdependence across space and scale. No one level of government can do it all. Each brings a distinct set of capacities and resources to the table. While the mobilizing of these capacities and resources is sometimes conflictual and politicized, the larger picture points towards positive outcomes for Canadians. These actions also reveal that the national and provincial governments each have a distinct legitimate interest in the economic, social, and environmental health of localities. What happens in any given locality affects others, potentially negatively. And when you add them up, local activities dictate the success of the province or the nation, socially, economically, or environmentally. The federal and provincial governments can and should care about what happens at the local level. So where does this lead us? To recap, demands for greater big city autonomy are commonplace in Canada and elsewhere. At the same time, the uneven incidence of policy problems across space demands place-based attention. Addressing these problems demands multi-level coordination, not disintegration. What principles should guide the construction of a system that maximizes local democratic accountability and the effective exercise of local autonomy? Well, I propose three. The first is to recognize that higher level governments have a legitimate interest in local affairs. The second principle is that spatial equity is a precondition for the meaningful exercise of local authority. Places compete with each other for residents, jobs, and investment. And for this to be a fair fight, communities must have more equal fiscal and administrative capacities. When adequately empowered and resourced, communities will be able to effectively exercise their legal authority. They will be autonomous. Otherwise, places that are already economically successful will win the, will win the competition every time. This requires redistribution of resources from successful to struggling places, not letting winners keep their spoils. The third principle is the minimization of negative externalities. Localities have no incentive to care about what goes on beyond their borders. And as a result, we've had problems over the years with pollution, unequal access to basic services and infrastructure, disjointed land use planning, destructive intermunicipal competition for economic development, and so on. These problems have been the most intense in growing metropolitan areas, but they occur everywhere. And ultimately, somebody needs to set the rules of the game, and it can't be the players themselves. Acting in the general interest, these are the jobs of higher level governments, which they perform through legislation and regulation, mandating processes, prohibiting certain activities, creating institutions, and redistributing resources. These principles could inform what I call the meta governance of place. Meta governance is an, ex is an emerging concept in policy studies that characterizes the art of governing at a distance or the regulation of self regulation. In our context, Meta-governance entails the federal and provincial rule sets and resource frameworks that enable the democratic exercise of local autonomy, not just by big successful cities, but by all localities. Canada's legal and institutional architecture for the meta-governance of place is elaborate and in constant evolution. Provinces require environmental assessments, they define building codes, they prohibit tax giveaways to attract business. Alberta, BC, Manitoba, and New Brunswick have created or are creating regional institutions for intermunicipal inter collaboration. The federal and provincial governments move money around through grants. Now, are higher level governments too interventionist in local affairs? This conference would not be happening if influential people did not hold this perception. 
So applying my principles, I think the answer is both yes and no. On the one hand, some provincial governments have clearly overstepped their core interest as meta-governors in facilitating creative democratic problem solving by localities while limiting negative externalities. I mean, what business is it of the Ontario government, how many councillors Toronto has, or whether London uses an alternative electoral system? And are all the conditions put on grants and local taxation justified? On the other hand, higher level governments may not be interventionist enough to establish the preconditions for the effective exercise of local autonomy. Pro provincial and federal governments may need to move more money around, not less. Will higher level governments always be enlightened meta-governors of place? Of course not. No level of government has a monopoly on probity and virtue. That is the fact of political life. Would constitutional change discipline higher level governments? Perhaps, but we have to be careful not to use a blunt instrument to create a worse situation, one in which the federal and provincial governments lose sight of their legitimate interest in all Canadian localities and their incentive to act on it. Each level of government needs the other to address serious problems, even if they don't always agree. The answer, as always, lies in politics. It's up to Canadians, as citizens of a multi-level polity, to ensure that the provincial and federal governments are effective meta-governors of all Canadian places. If we abdicate this responsibility, or if we institutionalize the secession of successful places, Canada will face only greater polarization, conflict, and governance malfunction in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Taylor, uh, and uh, let's move right away to uh, Professor Seti uh, for uh, his examples, international examples uh, that speak to uh, some of the problems as well of, of uh, big cities having lots of powers. Um, good morning, everyone, um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you know these distinguished panelists and at this um, really um, important conference. So broadly, my journey with this topic started several years back when as a law school student, I was part, and as a part of the legal clinic, we were helping the city of Philadelphia adopt CEDAW guidelines into its municipal codes, a treaty that you, the United States has not signed. Um, from there to there, you know, this topic has picked up pace and uh, I think this is a great time to, you know, delve deeper into it and examine it from a more comparative constitutional perspective. Um, so as we know, uh, most cities are conspicuously as absent from the constitutional space. Um, they are creatures of the province and are dependent on them for their functioning and very existence. Now, because of this reality, uh, it is argued that cities are unable to realize their entire potential and address various social, political, economic, and cultural challenges that are extremely unique to them. Um, hence, it is further argued that there's a need to emancipate cities and provide them with constitutional standing and greater autonomy. Now, while prima facie, this might seem like a very fair claim, several issues arise. Um, the first, I think, and the first, perhaps the most important is whether constitutional standing and greater autonomy for cities will address the issues they actually seek to address. Um, then there's the question of whether constitutional standing and greater autonomy for cities have any downsides. Uh, and lastly, there are several legal, political, and methodological obstacles in way of this very demand. Now, my articles are preliminary attempt to kind of chalk out these issues and suggest directions for both future research and political action. In some ways, like Professor Taylor before me, I also advocate for taking a step back in this discourse. Uh, my article aims to do three things. It first attempts to throw some gloss on evidence regarding the performance of three highly autonomous cities with constitutional standing, that's Hong Kong, Singapore, and Dubai, and discuss the lessons, if at all any, that we can draw from these examples. Secondly, it addresses some of the legal, political, and methodological issues that come up um, in this demand for more constitutional standing and greater autonomy. And lastly, based on these preceding points, it hopes to provide a framework to guide future discussions. Uh, somewhere down the line, it also hopes to make a weak case to rethink the demand for constitutional standing and greater autonomy, at least in the absolute short run. Uh, now, so starting with the first part of this paper, obviously envisioning a world where the state is not at the epicenter is challenging. Um, even in some of these cases where cities have autonomy, it's the federal government that's given it to them to forward specific economic or political agendas or administrative ease. In those cases, it's the federal government actually directing um, the terms and dictating the terms and not the constitution. 
Now, three examples I pick of Hong Kong, Singapore, and Dubai help shed some light on what an alternate wo the world might look like. Um, at the offset, I acknowledge that these aren't perfect examples. And in my paper, I give some brief reasons as to why I look at these three cities. Um, now, all these three cities could be considered extremely successful on many accounts. They're very impressive and thriving economies which were built from scratch. Uh, the quality of life in these cities, at least to some, is quite enviable. Moreover, all the economies have been developed by attracting foreign trade and investment, particularly in the modern area, era. On the economic front, there's very little to complain about. And all these cities have followed a rather similar pattern, albeit in different ways to reach where they are. That's open market economies and neo neoliberal policies to supplement them. Now, so far, so good. However, firstly, Dubai, Hong Kong, and Singapore are all port cities, with their ports being in the top 10 busiest ports in the world. Now, this has been a very significant factor in the rise of all these cities. Perhaps a skeptical question might arise, could non-port cities replicate the same economic success level to begin with them? Uh, could non-port cities sustain on their own? And this becomes even more relevant considering many cities that are economic hubs today are only so because the central government, the state wanted them to be. It's not necessary if you flip, flip the entire system around uh, that states would continue to focus on these cities. Nevertheless, this is just the start of some of the issues these examples throw up. Now, all these three cities in some way or the other have made sacrifices on grounds of human rights, democracy, income equality, and the pursuit of more investment and economic growth. A lot of times when these cities have modernized existing laws, it's not been to serve or benefit the bulk of the population, but draw more investment or keep investors happy. Uh, now, again, I acknowledge that you can't extrapolate a lot from these examples, but the one thing that, that these examples highlight is that by default, cities don't reduce corporate capture. Uh, great autonomy for cities doesn't reduce corporate capture or reduce income inequality, or perhaps has even been good for human rights. If anything, autonomous cities have pursued free market and neoliberal policies. Um, and this is not to say that, you know, um, more autonomy for cities won't work or wouldn't lead to desired outcomes. But the point is that more autonomy for cities by default wouldn't you know, address the challenges it seeks to address. Now, moving to the second point, and now I start with more of the, um, perhaps, um, the methodological, legal, and political challenges that come as we seek to achieve greater autonomy for cities. Uh, and I guess at the top of the list is how exactly will cities get more autonomy and constitutional standing? Now, every time a particular city, for example, say Toronto or any other city in the world wants autonomy, uh, the answer can't be that the citizens of the city um, carry out a movement, a, a secession movement to do the same. Now, not only would this be an in, inefficient way to not go about this whole thing, but it's also not the practical way. There's also the question of which cities get autonomy. Uh, and perhaps everyone would agree that the answer cannot be that every city gets autonomy. Um, some cities, especially in the global south, and smaller cities do not have the infrastructure and the resources in place to be autonomous. Uh, we could limit our discussions to large metropolitan areas like Professor Ran Herschel has done in his new book. Uh, but even with that, the issue is the methodological issue of defining what particular type of city is eligible for autonomy or greater standing. Is a metro a city with a population over an X number or a GDP of Y or a combination of these factors? Now, this is not an unanswerable question, but it's still a question, and it's still a question that needs to be addressed. There's some other creases to iron out in this entire debate, and um, a next point would be that what really is autonomy and constitutional standing when we talk about this entire debate? It's really straightforward to say that the residents of a city should have more say in their affairs, but then what are these affairs? Um, do we give the city complete autonomy in a way that it works um, as an independent country for all practical pur purposes? Or we do, do we envision cities on a model where large cities are the new provinces? Or do we go with like a third option where cities are envisioned in a three-tier federal framework and given autonomy to the extent that they can perform those functions realistically? Or rather the practical application of the principle of subsidiarity? Uh, there is the onerous job of figuring out uh, identifying those issues and figuring out what should be dealt at the city level, at the state level, at the federal level. Um, 
Additionally, no matter which route we pick from these, uh, there's still the administrative questions of taxation, distribution of incomes, and representation of the state and federal government that also need to be addressed. Uh, moreover, we have to recognize that um, you know, autonomy in whatever form it takes, um, like I, you know, bought those three examples that it is possible that cities might not take the torch forward, but, but might also take the torch backward on some points. Um, now, if we take the question of human rights, how do we deal with them? Do we, should, do we need a constitutional mechanism to prevent states from restricting human rights? Um, if yes, how do we do so? And all these points um, kind of lead to another practical dilemma. It's that if we envision this new regime, disputes or legal questions are bound to arise and someone has to solve them. And if and when we, even if, if and when we figure out the right jurisdictional forums, uh, there could be a need depending on a particular country of, and how the courts are structured in that country to allocate some courts more powers, increase the existing courts docket sizes, or even create more courts. And as you see, like there's, there's so many issues to address in this that it's really the only way to go about it in at least most scenarios and as an across the board exercise is major constitutional overhauls. And this leads to perhaps the most fundamental problems that in most parts of the world, especially in the global north, constitutional structures are incredibly rigid and it is tough to pass an amendment to bring about changes. Uh, to add to this, there's another problem. That's the lack of political will and incentives to do so. On the contrary, there's opposition to such ideas from politicians, uh, by and large, and there are several instances where um, the, um, the state or the federal government has tried to reduce the powers of important cities. And these are critical roadblocks that it's impossible to overlook them. Uh, envisioning something that requires overhauling the comp complete constitutional framework is a formidable challenge. And just to put it in context, only three democracies in the post-World War era have successfully managed to redraft their constitutions to address the needs of modernization. All other instances point towards a regime change or a state transitioning or a new democracy being formed. Now, the last part of my paper concludes with making the point that uh, considering all these challenges, uh, there's a simpler way by which we can address many of the problems that the demand for greater autonomy and constitutional standing for cities seeks to address. And this is tackling some particular issues that go a long way in addressing why constitutional standing and greater autonomy for cities is demanded in the first place, um, at least at a more practical level. The first is that the vote in a city generally and in most countries counts less than a vote in a rural area. Uh, the second is that, again, many cities, especially where this, there's this, a movement for great autonomy, they don't have enough money to address all their potentials, their needs, their problems. Uh, and if you look at the larger scheme of things, most problems flow some way or another from these macro problems. Now, the one thing I acknowledge again with the, these two issues is that, uh, they're quite extremely technical milk toast issues and that they don't have the glamour factor that the right to city discussions have. But perhaps this is the way going forward rather than chasing the impossible. Therefore, at a practical level and perhaps as a more across the board exercise, a realistic agenda, at least in the very short term, perhaps the next 10 years, would be pushing for changes to these more micro issues of political representation and finances. Uh, and just to, summing up my uh, kind of concluding my presentation, uh, one small advantage this would be, would this, this, my suggestion has, at least in the light of uncertainty whether autonomous cities can be successful, is that this, addressing these changes help perhaps retain some of the existing benefits of the status framework. Um, now, um, uh, for example, uh, Professor Oran Doyle argues that the present status framework has come about as a tool for elevating the ambiguity that surfaced from grouping the globe into several geographically separate legal systems. Now, Professor Doyle speculates that if cities were to dwell up as alternative sites of constitutional authority, undesirable uncertainties might uh, reemerge across the board. Uh, furthermore, cities across the globe, particularly mega cities, have been the site of some of the most reactionary, revolutionary, and 
violent political mobilizations. It might be said that the existing status, status framework provides the benefit of a moderating characteristic that would go unchecked if, um, if cities were given more autonomy than they currently have. And lastly, while exceptions exist, uh, the state's redistributive capacities and ability to provide public goods are, de are diminished as more decentralization occurs. Thus concluding in the face of an almost impossible idea and uncertainty over how it would work, um, the merits of the status framework might itself perhaps be a very small good reason to, reform, to start with reforming the existing system rather than overhauling it completely. Uh, I guess thank nonetheless, you. this is just, uh, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Seti. I think we see that there's lots of questions to to answers, and uh, we may want to look a little bit at, at uh, history for that and, and continue our reflections. So let me invite uh, Professor Lackmayer to, uh, to address us now. Thanks for having me. Um, just give me a second to start my presentation. Thanks for having me at your wonderful conference. And um, in the next uh, 10 minutes, uh, I will give you a short presentation of my thoughts of the interrelation between uh, constitutions and the cities from the perspective of empowering cities by constitutional pluralism. So let, let me start uh, my presentation with a short notice on the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and what we can observe in, uh, in this uh, crisis is that cities uh, are uh, a location not only for um, providing healthcare infrastructure, but also for negotiating democracy and thus uh, constitutionalism. So from uh, parliamentary decision-making to governmental press conferences, to demonstration and protests on the streets, uh, uh, all of this uh, happens and take place in uh, major cities. Uh, as already mentioned, in the next 10 minutes, uh, I will uh, focus uh, on uh, two elements. I will present you three paradigms of constitutions and the cities. And uh, in the second part, I will focus on constitutional pluralism and the potential of constitutional pluralism for cities. Uh, but when I'm starting to talk about this interrelation uh, of uh, constitutions and the cities, the constitutional role of the cities, I have to mention, first of all, the book of Ron Herschel, first of all, which was published last year, which really, uh, and I think we have to acknowledge that, uh, ha has uh, raised the level uh, of uh, constitutional scholarship uh, when it comes to city cities and constitutionalism. So the following presentation uh, will uh, build uh, up uh, on his uh, foundation and uh, analysis uh, of uh, these uh, questions. Uh, as already mentioned um, in my first part, I would like uh, to give you, um, uh, to present you three paradigms of constitutions and the cities from an historical uh, perspective. So the starting point, uh, which I think is quite important uh, to see is that our understanding of constitutions and constitutional law was shaped by cities. So the ancient polis in Greece uh, was a city-state concept and uh, starting to discuss questions of constitution, constitutional law like demos, democracy, um, uh, but also citizenship, uh, for example, starts uh, in ancient, uh, in the ancient uh, Greek concept um, of, uh, of a city. And still nowadays uh, in our constitutions, we will find these reflections of uh, the old uh, Greek uh, concept. And uh, this ancient concept uh, was continued uh, and transformed in the Roman Empire. And we will still find in the medieval times, uh, we will still find elements of old uh, city-state concepts in, in different forms. I cannot go into details here, but I provided some examples uh, in my paper. And uh, from this first paradigm uh, that uh, cities are shaping uh, constitutions, the second paradigm uh, changed it uh, in a very deep uh, manner. And uh, the rise of the territorial state in the post-Westphalian area um, pushed uh, cities back um, 
and uh, changed our understanding of state statehood um, completely. So when uh, the uh, constitution, the modern constitution came in in the 18th century, uh, the role of the city was already marginalized. So uh, on the one side in the federal state, uh, we uh, could observe that uh, the federation and the states became important, but also in the unitary state, um, the cities uh, uh, did not play a significant role anymore. And so nowadays uh, we are talking about constitutional silence as uh, Ron Herschel um, um, put it, that uh, the cities uh, uh, do not play a significant role in our modern constitutions. So uh, th this is the, uh, the second paradigm and the starting point uh, where we are uh, nowadays, uh, but we can even go on um, and look at uh, the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. And what we could observe uh, at uh, our times in the last uh, 30 to 40 years is uh, a transfer of power uh, to different other levels. Uh, so for, uh, coming from Europe, uh, the European Union could be mentioned, but also in the international sphere, we can see a fragmented international law with a lot of international organizations, um, but not only um, international organizations uh, organizing uh, states, um, but uh, also international organiz private international organizations like uh, standardization organization, um, or um, uh, I'm mentioning here on my slide, uh, sport organizations. So the, the, we, we will find uh, many different examples nowadays uh, of a hybrid network uh, of law, uh, which can also be analyzed and understood um, as um, from a constitutional perspective. And um, I'd like to mention Gunther Teubner, who's a German scholar uh, who wrote an uh, interesting book about societal constitutionalism. Um, and he's arguing uh, that we are facing constitutional fragments, not only uh, the constitutions of the nation state, but also constitutional fragments on an international level, uh, but also by private uh, corporations uh, which also participating in this uh, international hybrid constitutional network. So uh, what we can see is uh, that constitutional law, it's not only about national constitutions or maybe state constitutions in a federal system, uh, but that we will find uh, different forms of constitutional law um, and we can address uh, uh, questions, uh, constitutional questions on different uh, levels, uh, which are not hierarchical, but uh, which uh, are, uh, are conceptualized as um, a network. And uh, one element in this uh, network is also local constitutional law. So what I would like to argue and um, to illustrate to you is uh, that we, can understand questions of uh, constitutions and the cities uh, from this perspective of uh, a hybrid network of constitutional orders. So um, I'm coming to the second part uh, of my presentation. Uh, what will be the consequences of this uh, paradigm of constitutional pluralism and the cities? Uh, first um, element I would like to present to you is uh, an urban constitution. We should not only talk about con the constitutional status of cities, uh, which uh, I would uh, uh, argue is a top-down approach, but also about the constitutions of the cities. Um, living in the city of Vienna in Austria, uh, the uh, Austria, Vienna already has a, a city constitution. Uh, this is what it is uh, formally uh, uh, what, what's the formal name is, um, and the uh, city uh, of Vienna uh, already provides uh, such a constitutional understanding um, of, of um, its uh, basic uh, foundational uh, legal um, statute. And I would call this a bottom-up approach. Um, so from a bottom-up approach, uh, we can talk about constitutional law on the city level which is legitimizing, determining, 
uh, determining and uh, limiting the powers of the city. And this uh, constitution of a city can be linked uh, to the other uh, 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 to the other levels of, of constitutional law and constitutional orders, um, like uh, the constitutional status of the city uh, in the domestic uh, constitution. Um, we can also go beyond uh, the nation state uh, and uh, interrelating uh, cities constitution. So constitutional learning uh, between different cities. Obviously this uh, also calls uh, upon the question of foreign affair powers of cities or like uh, in the European Union, we have the committee of regions. Uh, uh, there could be uh, different forms of committees uh, of the cities and finally, uh, from a hybrid constitutional network perspective, uh, there's a the question if urban constitutions can also be linked uh, to international organizations or international private actors and uh, their uh, influence and interrelation uh, to uh, cities. I'm not going into detail about questions of urban autonomy. Uh, the other presenters already uh, went uh, much more into detail here. But I just wanted to mention uh, that uh, from a uh, constitutional uh, law of the cities, uh, we, we can uh, have a look at urban constitutionalism. And we sh should not only talk about increasing urban autonomy, but also about op opposing the repression on cities, which is also happening uh, these uh, days. So uh, to come uh, to a conclusion, time is uh, uh, <laughs> running fast. Um, so what is the constitutional potential of uh, cities? Um, from my perspective, uh, we should uh, think about urban labs of constitutionalism. There's uh, much uh, discussion about urban innovation, but uh, there's also a potential for urban innovation for constitutionalism in the 21st uh, century. Um, and the second element I would like to stress is involving cities in constitutional pluralism by uh, approaching uh, cities uh, from the perspective of urban constitutions and constitutional network of cities, states and cooperation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this uh, uh, European perspective on it and very interesting and useful. So uh, let's go to uh, Professor de Visser and, uh, and uh, looking forward to hearing you. Many thanks for that, Natalie, and I'm delighted to be here. It's good morning for all of you. It's good evening for me in Singapore, the city state where I'm currently based. Now, what I would like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is to interrogate that question of the constitutional silence when it comes to cities. Now, I don't want to talk about why states may or may not want to recognize cities, but rather what I'd like to do is share some thoughts on how the constitutional recognition of cities can take place if and when states decide to do so. Now, my focus will be on typical cities, that's to say, not on national capitals, or on other cities that enjoy a privileged legal position. And what I hope to do, um, it's, a, it's a quite a modest aim, is to set out two broad approaches. The first approach to the constitutional recognition of cities is government centric. And that would largely amount to a codification of existing arrangements. Although as we shall see, there will be room for a sort of evolutionary dynamic especially as far as the scope of city autonomy is concerned, something that we've spoken about quite a bit today already. Now, the second approach, which I will refer to as denizen-centric, has a more radical or progressive flavor. Now, to be clear, these two approaches should be seen as ideal types. They're not diametrically opposed options with states being required to choose either one or the other. Now, indeed, as and when states decide to formally enshrine cities in their constitution, aspects of both approaches can actually be combined quite neatly. In developing the two approaches, I'll draw mainly on insights from Europe, as European countries have ample practical experience with multi-level governance structures, as Conrad has just so very clearly set out. 
This is both historically as well as contemporaneously as members of the European Union and the Council of Europe. So let me then start with the first approach. Now, the first approach to constitutionalizing cities can take as its starting point their role in delivering national government agendas. And that has become an increasingly important role. Now, the view of those in the city administration as the proverbial boots on the ground that make laws a practical reality is very much in keeping with a classic principal agent paradigm. Now, when we look at European constitutions, at present, the Italian one is the only one to explicitly recognize one category of cities in its description of what can be called a delivery agent role. Article 118 of the Constitution says, and here I quote, municipalities, provinces, and metropolitan cities must carry out the functions assigned to them by state or by regional legislation. Now, even though other constitutions do not formally refer to this traditional role, it is clear that they all subscribed to this agent logic, which is, at the end, instrumental to the functioning of modern day regulatory states. So what states may want to do is constitutionally recognize this agent role that is performed by cities, thereby ensuring that the law matches practical realities or at least to a greater extent than it does at present, which is very much in line with something that Zach has also advocated in his presentation. Now, such a recognition could extend to the formal, could extend to formal references to the mechanisms and the principles that pertain to the performance of this agent role. And here we could think of a supremacy clause or a duty of loyal cooperation. Doing so would provide a clear frame to both the national level as well as cities to manage their relationships and work through disagreements. Now, when enshrining cities in the constitutions, states can, however, also go beyond affirming or, if you want, codifying the status quo. On the occasion of enshrining cities, they may take this opportunity to recalibrate the dynamics of a principal agent relationship. This can take the form of cities being conceived as genuinely empowered agents that can be trusted with considerable autonomy in discharging the tasks that are allocated to them. Now, doing so would mean taking uh, subsidiarity seriously and a reciprocal understanding of the principle of loyalty. Now, taking subsidiarity seriously would mean leaving cities ample room to adapt the application of national legal rules to suit local conditions. It may even extend to providing cities with avenues to challenge perceived central government overreach. Now, in a related vein, states could recast the notion of constitutional self-government, which is often recognized for cities, to accommodate greater autonomy for cities to design their internal governance structures and processes. This would be much like the EU principle of procedural and institutional autonomy for member states when it comes to the implementation of EU rules. In this regard, the central government would exercise oversight over whether legislative objectives are realized rather than over how such is done. Just to be clear, this would of course be subject to adherence to basic rule of law and constitutionalism principles. Now, turning to the principle of loyalty, this could be understood as properly two-dimensional, in line very much with the approach taken in Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on European Union. This provision in its current formulation stipulates that, and I quote again, pursuant to the principle of sincere cooperation, the European Union and the member states shall, in full mutual respect, assist each other in carrying out the tasks which flow from the treaties. So that's to say, loyalty is seen as applying not only in a bottom-up fashion where cities need to be these loyal agents, but also in what has been called the reverse vertical relationship, so the top-down arrangement. This can, amongst others, require the national government to ensure that it supports and strengthens the capacity of cities to perform their functions, to paraphrase framing that is currently found in the South African constitution. Now, moving beyond the agent approach, 
A second approach to the constitutionalization of cities would privilege their social function vis-a-vis -vis their inhabitants rather than vis-a-vis -vis other tiers of government. A denizen-centric approach is more closely aligned with conceptualizations of the city and social geography rather than the federalism literature with which the government-centric approach is typically imbued. So scholars like Dahl or Schrager or Sassen would see cities first and foremost as sites for individual and collective development. This view also matches the self-identification of growing numbers of European cities and cities elsewhere. It's also finding traction beyond the state. We can see this in the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which speaks of sustainable cities, or in the rise of the so-called human rights or sanctuary cities. Now, a denizen-centric approach can find expression through co constitutional provisions that emphasize the democratic character of urban governance, as well as adherence to standards of good governance. This would cover opportunities for city dwellers to have a voice in the election of the city government. Some European constitutions already feature a local dem democracy principle that can provide inspiration. For example, the Swedish instrument of government acknowledges that Swedish democracy is realized through local self-government. As Gerald Frug has famously argued, an important public freedom is realized when individuals can partake in the basic societal decisions that structured our lives, which, is, which leads him to argue in favor of the empowerment of cities. Now, a principle of urban democracy would refi invite reflection on who would be eligible to participate in such a democracy. Here, the possibility of a form of citizenship distinct from, but complementary to, national citizenship would come to mind. Such a citizenship could be enjoyed by those who factually belong to the urban community, but who do not hold the passport of the country in which the city is located. An example of a legal order that accepts dual citizenship of different spatial orders is the European Union. Every person who is a national a citizen of an EU member state also holds the status of citizen of the EU and is hence entitled to active and passive suffrage in local elections in whichever EU member state this person is residing. Now, the creation of this transnational and clearly inchoate form of citizenship necessitated constitutional amendments in several European countries. Now, interestingly, pre-existing understandings of national sovereignty did not present any serious obstacle to the expansion of these local or urban city voting rights beyond the citizenry. Beyond the citizenry. But states could go further still and formally accept a role for cities in realizing a, for a fuller range of fundamental rights. And here we could draw a connection to the right to or through the city. Now, this right has been defined as the equitable usufruct of cities within the principles of sustainability, democracy, equity, and social justice. Now, while this right has been characterized as highly abstract, it should be noted that there have been concerted efforts to concretize it so as to make this right to a city operational. Now, the UCLG Forum of Local Authorities has, for instance, drafted a 12-point agenda that lists the human rights implicated in this overarching right, like the right to participatory democracy, the right to nonviolent congregation, or the right to accessible public services. So efforts along these lines can help to lay the groundwork for the legal codification of a right to or through the city, and by implication, the constitutional recognition of cities as sites for the realization of human rights of both resident nationals and non-citizens. Now, a possible implication of a denizen-type constitutional empowerment is the creation of a multi-layered system for rights protection within the state. This may mean that provision needs to be made for the central government to have some form of oversight over city-steered interpretation of rights. Also, there might be a need for national interpreters of the Constitutional Bill of Rights, be it courts or ombudsmen or national rights institutions, to accommodate flexibility in the meaning ascribed to rights across territorial units. 
very much like the margin of appreciation used within the Council of Europe. So let me conclude by highlighting two pertinent issues that need to be considered as and when states initiate a process to constitutionally enshrine cities. The first is a definitional issue. What counts as a city and would be covered by the responsibilities or rights that are constitutionally enshrined? I mentioned Italy, which mentions the metropolitan cities, but the constitution did not identify which cities were covered. When the law was eventually adopted, setting up the cities that were considered lucky enough for this purpose, those who didn't make the list tried to petition the central government to nevertheless be included at the end. Now, the second would concern the design of the constitutional amendment process, and that would link to Amal's presentation earlier. I think it's very important to have an inter echelon dialogue about the objective to be realized by a city empowering constitutional amendment. Is it more the government-centric kind of amendment or the, de the denizen-centric approach? Do we want to codify existing small c norms or do we, we, we want to, or do we want to reconstitute the relationship? I think this is crucially important to ensure that whatever text is eventually agreed upon will not become either a debt letter or a source of discontent. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, you have a, a good task, uh, Paul, to uh, uh, bring it all together a little bit and, and uh, get us on our discussion framework, Paul. Well, well I, will, uh, I, I will do my best. Um, as you know, uh, Natalie, I am a, um, a humble uh, administrative lawyer. Um, that's my, uh, my primary area of uh, research interest and expertise. And so my, my comments are going to be informed uh, by, that, uh, by that framing. Um, I really just have, have two comments on uh, two themes or perhaps even tensions that uh, ran through the, uh, the presentation. Um, the, the first is um, uh, the uh, distinction between uh, bottom-up and, uh, and top-down um, approaches, which um, uh, Conrad um, mentioned in his, uh, in his presentation. Um, the, um, there is an assumption uh, when we talk about uh, uh, cities and constitutional reform that uh, top-down change is needed. And in part, that's because constitutional structures require uh, decisions by uh, those at levels above uh, the, the level of the city. Uh, and indeed, in, in Canadian law and in the common law tradition, uh, we consider uh, cities to be uh, creatures of the uh, of the pro of uh, of statute. Um, and so, uh, any change uh, would have to be top down in nature. Um, however, um, and I think uh, here, um, Professor Taylor made the point very powerfully um, about uh, the scope for um, cities uh, in the delivery of, of services uh, to uh, exercise a significant degree of judgment and discretion. Um, in fact, the administrative law literature uh, studying uh, empirically um, the implementation of government policy by administrative decision makers reveals that there is significant scope for the exercise of discretion and judgment by those on the front lines of public administration. Indeed, those uh, at the front lines of public administration uh, find themselves delegated uh, tasks um, of uh, mediating between different uh, constitutional values and different aspects of uh, political philosophy, which cannot be delegated any further. And so the so-called street level bureaucrats, uh, the uh, gray suited uh, functionnaire um, that uh, we, we often deride, uh, in fact, uh, exercise public power um, in a, a very uh, profound way. They uh, make decisions which cannot be delegated any further. And so it seems to me that even if you conceive of cities as merely agents of government there to deliver services and implement policy directed from on high, uh, the administrative law literature uh, suggests, and Professor Taylor's presentation also suggests, that those uh, the implementation of policy uh, is a site uh, for uh, cities to make 
uh, discretionary judgment calls about how best to, to further the objectives of the policy while also uh, furthering uh, objectives that the city considers to be important. And if we uh, insert cities as Professor Lackmire would in uh, global uh, networks, um, that is all the more so true. And there is a, a wealth of uh, experience and expertise in those networks that cities can draw upon when uh, implementing uh, government policy. So even if we take that the narrowest conception of what a city does, uh, the service delivery uh, conception um, that uh, Professor De Visser uh, was, uh, was discussing, we still see this as a potential site of empowerment um, for, for cities. And I think um, the, the bottom-up approach of taking what cities are already doing and realizing that as a site for engagement, uh, deliberation um, is entirely possible and is um, at the very least a complement, if not an alternative to a top-down approach to uh, reform of cities. The second theme is uh, a, a tension between, if you will, uh, reason and authority. Now, is power legitimate? because it is exercised by those who have the authority to exercise it. That is, they have been granted authority by uh, a constitution or by legislation to exercise a power and they follow the proper procedures and they exercise the power. Is it legitimate for that reason, because of their authority? Or is the exercise of power legitimate because it is reasoned, because it is a reasoned exercise of public power. So cities, are they, is the exercise of power in the city legitimate because it is the uh, expression of legislative or constitutional will? So, uh, Professor Sethi uh, mentioned the different types of economic objectives that you might uh, set cities up to have. Uh, do they derive their legitimacy from the fact that they are exercising those competences which have been lawfully conferred upon them? Or alternatively, are cities only exercising power legitimately where they do so through reasoned deliberative processes and providing reasons for the decisions they take? Now that is a, a fundamental question and all the panelists have been, have been grappling with it. Um, for my part, uh, I think there is a great deal to say for the so-called what we in administrative law call a culture of justification, where exercises of public power have to be justified. They have to uh, demonstrate the expertise of those who are exercising the power, and they have to be responsive to the arguments presented to them and to the needs, I would say, in the context of the city, to the needs of the people they serve and the people who are considered to be part of the uh, part of the polis of the city. Um, so a culture of justification, it, it seems to me, uh, is the, the, the better way to go if cities are to, uh, to realize the, uh, the potential um, that, they, that they have of using their discretion and judgment in a reasoned way and using deliberative processes to uh, justify the exercises of public power. I think if cities engage in a culture of justification and base their legitimacy on reason rather than on authority, uh, cities will be in a much better place to uh, play uh, the leading role that, um, that uh, we all think they should play uh, in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Merci, uh, Paul. Uh, thank you. Well, what very rich panel. I think if I had to uh, uh, summarize before I get to the, the questions from the from the the the, the 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 audience, I would say it's interesting. Like this entire conference is about better governance. It's about uh, better governance. And if I go to uh, Professor Taylor's paper, it would be about what are the instruments that we have outside of politics. Uh, certainly, politics will always be there, but to limit overreach or to in include or encourage or precipitate or guarantee even positive obligations of transfer of wealth and redistribution and so on. So, um, so it's not, you know, so that's kind of an interesting piece for me, you know, and if we go, we use uh, uh, Professor De Visser's 
uh, framework, it would be from government to government. You may want to curtail or uh, uh, argue for and, and, and reflect on that structural uh, elements that are going on. So throughout the conference, you'll see that we'll talk about intergovernmental transfers and so on, how to make sure that they are reliable and that they, uh, they work well. On the other side, I think we have uh, Professor Sethi and also uh, Professor de, Misser, uh, de Visser talking about the obligations of the city uh, to be indeed, and, and to a certain extent, Professor Lackmeyer about the bottom up, you know, how do we the obligations of the city to be truly democratic and truly protective of human rights uh, and how do we construct that to ensure good governance in that sense and you know to be a site of deliberative democracy uh, or justification as paul would say so uh, my question is do you see examples uh, where the use of law could be helpful in both of these areas i mean professor de Visser talked a little bit about this are they are they avenues there that we should explore further as we move in the, in the the next chapter of this uh, of this conference so let's start uh, why don't i start do a, a tour de table you know start with professor taylor and seti uh, like mayor and de Visser and paul as well um in turn and then i think what i sense from the 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 audience is very much i want to know about how do cities control big corporations and so on are they you know is it is there a uh, are they being captured or could they be captured uh by uh by powerful economic actors but uh zach let's start with you uh, professor taylor <laughs> yeah thank you um I mean, to that latter point, the you know, speaking with my political science hat on, there's a long tradition of studies uh, about the matter of capture, right? Mm -hmm. And and to to uh, uh, to a large degree, this has to do with matters of scale, right? Even very large uh, <laughs> urban uh, jurisdictions are too small, right, to be able to to internalize these these forces which uh, operate at an increasingly large scale. I think that's why we need something like multi-level governance, right? We need to mobilize capacities at, at broader uh, territorial scales in order to be able to create the kind of uh, local democratic environments that we that we need. I mean, my primary concern is that in focusing on constitutions and, and legal remedies to all of this, um, is that we we risk turning this into a, a, a matter of federalism. Right, an extension of our current logic, which uh, uh, has, uh, with which we're not particularly satisfied. And I think that Martia's point about uh, a, den a denizen-centric approach, right, is is um, uh, a, a very useful lens, right? Uh, you know, thinking about uh, uh, Warren Magnuson's very interesting work on seeing like a city, right, as a, as an alternative to a, a statist uh, way of understanding authority. Professor Seti. So, so the, the, I'll, I'll, you know, stick to the issue of the co of corporate capture, and I think you know this this is this is kind of an important topic because um, perhaps you know one of the main things is this this whole argument that you know how can cities you know just be financially independent and a lot of times just with the current setup they rely a lot on because they don't have the money they they rely on perhaps corporations to fill in that void uh, again here you know just with a general theme of my own paper where i've like just expressed a lot of skepticism uh, perhaps i'm not you know solving this issue anymore but i corporate capture is something that we've not been able to even eliminate at the absolute federal level even in as big a country as we see, you go to the United States of America. Even there, you know, big corporations have big corporations, big billionaires. They have so much voice. So perhaps, um, you know, this is something that just expecting great autonomy for cities. It, it might be just a stretch too much. Um, and I think, you know, the entire perhaps for me, I really sympathize. While you know, the, I've expressed a lot of skepticism. I really. As someone who's never stayed outside a city, I really sympathize with this. I, I think, you know, great autonomy for cities, constitutional spaces for cities is something that's really important. Um, and that's completely in line with my own politics. Uh, but I think, you know, we need to like really start more targeting. And as we, you know, 
proceed with the framework? What's what's the best way we can, you know, perhaps redesign things to facilitate better, better governance? And while that, that this is not being, you know, something I've addressed in my paper, at least at this phase, I think, you know, we need to like really start thinking more about multi-level governance, uh, more three-tier structures. That's where, you know, currently, I guess, uh, you know, I'm looking at this whole debate. That's 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 the direction you know I'm more leaning towards. But I think you know perhaps it's rather than trying to do too much, um, we should you know go back to just thinking about is is a three tier system better than a two tier system, and what would that three tier system look like? So that's currently I guess where I am um, more trying to frame this debate in like better governance terms. Thank you. Professor Lackmeyer. Um, so, sorry for bringing up the cooperation topic, <laughs> um, but uh, may, may, maybe uh, uh, two thoughts about that. The first is maybe a question uh, to my colleague Taylor on the panel. Um, uh, I, I was wondering um, if I understood you correctly, you are arguing in favor of that the domestic government is necessary to provide the necessary framework for local autonomy. Um, but I was wondering, especially when it comes to corporation capture, if, uh, if the knowledge exchange between the cities globally would be even also a necessary tool for getting um, best practice examples or way of dealing um, with these international corporations, uh, because uh, um, in, in many, uh, the, the territorial state, maybe also, if it's, okay. if, especially it's, if it's a small one, mm -hmm. they do not have the knowledge about how to deal with the international cooperation. So nor the city, uh, neither the city nor mm -hmm. the, uh, the um, uh, domestic uh, government uh, has the necessary knowledge uh, how, how to go on. So maybe it's more about this networks or knowledge exchange of cities. So this, this was just then. Maybe a question I would like to ask. I stop here. It's well, not either see. or, it's both, Conrad. It's, okay. it's you know, okay. we, we aren't working in one dimension here. We're working, uh, you know, it's Multiple. layers. Mm -hmm. It's networks, as, mm -hmm. as was put earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Professor De Visser, you know. Yeah, so I, I don't have, if you want a lot more uh, new things to add to this, but um, one of the challenges I suppose when it comes to um, capture by big corporations is that they often try to place cities off one another. Mm -hmm. So there is a form of arbitrage or if you want regulatory competition. And they do this often by even stepping over the other territorial layer. So you can ignore the central level, perhaps even the provincial level where it exists. So they're already one of the ways to mitigate this. And, and here I agree with Amal. I don't think that we should hope for a situation where cities will be entirely autonomous. But what would help if you is if you have stronger ties between cities. So at least there is a sense of awareness or perhaps cities bundling power together and saying, we want to engage with the corporation, but we also can set some terms and help to structure the conversation where we're not just, if you want, a rule taker, but we're a rule maker in the negotiations. So I think here I'm, I'm most familiar with the examples in Europe. Some of the networks in place there have actually managed to push back um, not just against corporations, but also against their own nation states and engage, for instance, directly with the EU in order to pursue their own agenda. So I would say I'm quite optimistic there. Now, the other thing, and here perhaps to linking it back about issues of democracy, I think we often invoke the principle of subsidiarity without having a very clear understanding of what it means. So if you look back to subsidiarity historically, it was actually a principle of democracy. It was about social organization, ensuring that what can be done close to people would be done closest to the people. Whereas by now, we often see it as a very utilitarian principle where we talk about scale and effects and efficiency. So the moment we, we use the paradigm of subsidiarity as utilitarian, then we straight away move away from empowering cities because they don't have the scale to do it. Mm -hmm. 
Whereas if we, and, and here I think, you know, Paul, when you said, where do they get their legitimacy? If we go back to that original idea of subsidiarity as democracy, you have a much stronger case there. Well, I like that. The, the idea, I thought that your denizen uh, uh, was very much about the, the, the legitimacy coming from the participation of citizens in their own governance, yeah. uh, hence in, uh, enhancing their democracy, and maybe their ability to resist uh, uh, the, the imposition of, of, of power by no matter what actors uh, outside. Uh, Paul, uh, any uh, any comments on the, um, your uh, your being an administrative lawyer? That uh, capture is something you often uh, yes. talk about in administrative law. Well, I think uh, I think with both um, uh, whether one looks at corporations or or nation states, they are uh, indeed potential. Uh, potential enemies or potential sources of pushback, and I think in both cases, the uh, the stronger a city is, the stronger it uh, the stronger it, it, it in using its the resources which already exist to empower themselves, uh, cities will be better placed to resist predation um, in all its forms, whether that's um, corporate in nature or uh, it's the nation state um, which is the uh, uh, which is the predator? Um, I think uh, empowering from the bottom up uh, is uh, is the answer in in both cases. Yeah. So we're getting to the end of our of our. I just wanted to uh, hear you. It's we have four minutes left before uh, the the curtain is is drawn. Is the problem uh, electoral? Uh, is it the fact that the votes, as Mal said, uh, the votes of of urban voters is worth less? Is that the, the is that one of the issue that has to be factored here, or is it more um, that uh, cities need better, uh, you know, access to finances or better uh, ways in which to resist uh, overreach? Is that is that uh, that's that's one of the questions. Let's start with Conrad and 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 go quickly around. Conrad. Very short. Uh... I think uh, both questions are, are crucial. So uh, from my perspective, uh, qu question of uh, democracy within the city is crucial. Democracy uh, uh, on the domestic level and the role of the cities in this is, is also uh, relevant. But I'm, I'm stopping here. So. Amal? Um, I mean, I agree with Conrad, but uh, for me, I think um, I think it's a very big problem and perhaps might just be true, though there are a lot of other issues. But yes, I, I'll leave it at that. I think it's a very, very major problem and it it's contributes to the significant, um, it's a very big reason why we are having this debate. Uh, Paul? Yes, no, I mean, um, the, the fewer people you have uh, engaged uh, in politics, uh, the more uh, the, the more problematic it is. Um, and figuring out strategies for, for public engagement um, is a uh, is a significant challenge. And it's it's hard to know whether that comes first or whether using power is already at city's disposal um, come, comes first. You have to show people the way um, in order to engage them or um, will you only be able to find the way if you uh, if you engage the people? Um, that's a, that's a difficult that's question. Okay. Chicken and egg. Uh, Marty, Professor de Visser. <laughs> Absolutely fine. I, I agree. So I would even say that democracy should be more than just the right to vote. I think we're moving towards more direct democracy. And if we want participation, a city seems in you know the typical city seems to be a more promising site to realize that than if we keep our eye focused on the national level it could be a training ground not just for civic skills but also to integrate because it's easier to include non-nationals so that would fit in well with themes of yeah. inequality migration and globalization and zach last word to you <laughs> yeah very briefly i, I mean we we know that uh, that the votes of, of people who who live in urban areas uh, uh way less right than than people in other uh parts of the country and because of the of verbiage in our constitution that overweight uh certain provinces and and, and so on but we also know that uh, politically um we we have a relatively depoliticized uh, system of boundary drawing for our electoral districts compared certainly to the United States, which is a good thing. Uh, and we also know that uh, uh, we've added 
most seats in uh, in Cities. rapidly growing urban areas, right? Yeah. So this may be yeah. correcting itself in terms of voice. Well, uh, that was a great start for our, our conference. Uh, different points of view, uh, tensions, are we asking the right questions? Uh, uh, more to come. Thank you. And uh, let's uh, let's see what, what else we can discuss. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.